Hello and welcome everyone. It is uh, one o'clock Eastern, so we will go ahead and kick off uh, another NETEC COVID-19 webinar series. Today we are discussing workforce innovation, uh, reassign and deploy staff during COVID-19 pandemic. I am Sonia Bell. I'm one of the project directors for NETEC and I will be hosting this webinar today. Uh, so again, starting off with the welcome, that's with me here. Uh, then we will go into the Nebraska experience, workforce innovation, reassign and deploy staff during COVID-19 pandemic with David Seeley. Then we'll go to the New York experience with uh, Omar Abdul Rahman. And then the Emory experience with Dina Gilland and Bonnie Pru. And then at the end, I'll overview some resources and we'll do some Q&A with the subject matter experts. And so kind of an overview on NETEC, if you're new to us, uh, the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Our mission is to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. Uh, for more information, visit us at our website, www.netech.org. And you can email us with questions at any time at info at netech.org. Uh, some of the work that we do is we do empower hospitals to gauge their own readiness using self-assessments. Um, we measure facility and healthcare, working, healthcare worker readiness using metrics, and we provide on-site assessments when we can travel. Also, of course, education. Uh, this is part of our educational initiative here is webinars. We also have online trainings and uh, in-person courses. <clears throat> Technical assistance, we do on-site and remote guidance. Um, we have an online repository that also includes uh, customizable exercise templates for facilities. And our research network, where we have an online repository to rapidly implement clinical research protocols, and also a centralized IRB and an infrastructure for a specimen bio repository. And with that, I will hand this off to David Seeley to talk about the Nebraska experience. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for their time and NETEC for the opportunity to speak today. I'm David Seeley. I'm the Resource Manager at Nebraska Medicine, and my role in the organi organization before the pandemic was related to scheduling and staffing of our inpatient units. Since staffing was a key component of addressing the pandemic, I had the opportunity to work with a great team of individuals to develop, to develop plans and processes for Nebraska Medicine. I'm excited to share and highlight some of the massive amounts of work done from departments all across the organization. I'm going to discuss today's objective of developing strategic responses for reassigning workforce and redeployment to help overcome operational challenges related to COVID-19. Early conversations at Nebraska Medicine focused on increasing inpatient capacity. That involved identifying and creating 100 additional beds available for inpatients. We were short staffed on our inpatient units before the pandemic and we needed a way to staff these beds even though we already had vacant positions. To increase capacity of staff, we used the Society of Critical Care Medicine structure to create a team-based care model. We created a modified team model specifically to meet our organizational needs for both critical care and med surge units. The model for our critical care units is shown on the slide. I'll note this was the maximum amount of stretching of resources we thought we could do without compromising patient care. If we had additional resources, we used them to supplement the model shown. The first area to feel the staffing shortage was critical care, especially our staff nurses, which is an issue we are still experiencing. Each team could care for a maximum of eight patients with an intensivist responsible for multiple teams based on availability. We did notice with critical care COVID patients that a team of six patients was more appropriate based on acuity and PPE requirements. The miscellaneous team on the slide consisted of residents, CRNAs, and non-critical care APPs. The support team consisted of individuals from pharmacy, respiratory therapy, and nutrition. The critical care RNs were currently trained ICU nurses, and the RN extenders in the critical care team model were individuals from our PACU department and highly skilled med surge nurses. This plan was presented to and approved by organizational acute care leadership since it affected both provider and staff. Uh, based on critical care needs, we did begin team nursing in our ICU. Our normal staffing ratio is two patients per critical care nurse. The team model doubled ICU RN staffing capacity with the use of RN extenders. I'll again note that this was the maximum amount of stretching we believe staff could do and not something we needed for all shifts. 
The sli this slide shows our plan for med surge units for teams of 10 to 12 patients with the hospitalist responsible for up to three care teams. Our RN in the model is a currently trained med surge inpatient RN. Our team model calls for two extenders and these extenders in the med surge model were RNs from non inpatient areas who were pulled back and trained to work as part of a care team. I will note that current med surge nurses were assigned as extenders when available. Beyond our inpatient capacity, we had many new operational needs, such as handing out masks at entrances. At the same time, we were suspending elective encounters. Nebraska Medicine made a commitment at the beginning of the pandemic to keep individuals working. With the postponement of elective activities, many employees' normal job role wasn't needed. Those staff members were provided with two options. One, they could stay home and use PTO until they were needed back in their home department. Or two, they were offered the opportunity to join the flex pool. The flex pool was the term used by Nebraska Medicine for the group of employees who wished to remain working but were not needed in their regular job role. To join the flex pool, staff needed to meet two criteria. One, colleagues joining the flex pool needed to be willing to work any date and time in any role in which they were assigned. This was key since a lot of roles needed due to the pandemic didn't exist before March and were in required non-traditional hours. The second criteria was colleagues joining the flex pool needed to go online and complete an online profile. Sammy, our project manager, had the brilliant idea to engage IT and have them assist us in building a web page for flex pool colleagues to enroll. They delivered a product beyond anything we had initially expected. Enrollment to this site is what we use to measure the size of our flex pool and identify the skills a person possessed to help us place them in the most productive role. The sign up form was available through a web link on our intranet page, as well as an individual's personal device through our organizational application. This slide shows the initial login page where employees gave us their contact information and created a password for their online profile. Upon initial enrollment, employees had the opportunity to, provi to provide their experience. Skill categories were identified that we anticipated would be needed during the pandemic. We allowed FlexPool participants participants to identify those skills they possessed. We needed a skills inventory to ensure we weren't overlooking someone with a critical skill set and assigning them to a task that didn't require that skill set. Employees also had the opportunity to communicate their schedule preferences. It's no surprise most preferences were day shifts during the week, but it was helpful to know which staff preferred the evening and overnight and weekend shifts. Many of the roles joining the flex pool worked a traditional Monday through Friday schedule, and many of the new operational needs to support COVID required 24-7 support. The any date, time, and role expectation became important based on the additional 24-7 support needs. After colleagues signed up for the flex pool, we identified a need for managers to request flex pool resources. Our IT team created an additional form for managers to go and request flex pool resources. This request form asked a lot of the same information, like what type of skills the position required. That enabled us to assign an appropriate member of the flex pool to the role. The form allowed requests for a single shift or more multiple days. These completed forms were automatically emailed from the system to a shared inbox that was managed by our central resource team. Our IT team also did a great job of creating dashboards in the system that helped us match request forms with available staff. For example, we could filter by the emergency department skill and an availability preference for Saturday night. This allowed us to handle these requests in an orderly fashion and honor staff preferences when possible. The site also had a field where we could track the cost center and job code the person worked in for reporting purposes. Our initial work revolved around the immediate need for a site for employees to enroll in the flex pool, but as that was completed, we had additional requests for a site related to MD and APP providers, and IT was also able to build that. Um, we also built a similar site for student volunteers to sign up from our academic partners. We never reached the point of utilizing students, but did build out the structure in case it were needed. It was exciting to see the innovation in creating new teams and redeployment of staff to support areas with increased volume. The first department to see an increase in volume was our call center. We moved RN and non-RN staff from other departments to help with the additional call volume. This was especially challenging because the need arose as we were creating the flex pool, so we were still creating our processes around redeployment of staff. To implement our care team model, we needed inpatient nurse extenders. The team model shown in previous slides showed that additional need for RNs to work as med surge extenders on our inpatient units. 
These were RNs working in non-inpatient departments that could be trained to work with an inpatient RN to assist in the care of a group of patients. Another thing we created was a prone team. COVID caused an increase in volume of patients needing to be prone. We found it helpful to have a team of experts assigned to this task to provide consistency. With a concern of PPE availability, Nebraska Medicine started decontaminating and reissuing N95 masks. This was a labor-intensive process that required staff around the clock. We also created a team of highly trained PPE experts. This group was very well received and appreciated by our staff. Our PPE experts received training from our infection preventionists, preventionists on how to properly don and doff PPE. We had a PPE expert assigned 24-7 to each of our COVID units. This role was especially helpful since we had new staff floating into our COVID units constantly. We also had a need for an inpatient portal enrollment team and tablet setup team. With the implementation of a no visitor policy, there was an increased need for helping patients enroll in our online application and set up communication with family. We deployed a team of individuals to help inpatients enroll in our application to ensure patients were able to participate in telehealth follow-up visits. This team was also deployed to help with setting up video calls for patients to talk with family and friends. We created an inpatient and outpatient swab team. This group was trained to perform swab testing in our inpatient and outpatient setting, and we created the support resource team, which was a task-based support team. This team could be deployed to perform tasks like bringing wheelchair patients from the front door to appointments or delivering decontaminated N95 masks to the appropriate location. They had their own phone number to contact to have a resource deployed for a particular task. Next slide, please. The flex pool was very helpful in meeting new staffing needs, but did come with some challenges and lessons learned. A few highlights of lessons learned were, we identified a need for central administration and centralized contact number for the flex pool. We didn't anticipate initially having such a large flex pool and quickly identified a need for additional resources to help with deployment and assignment. In the beginning, we split this up between inpatient and ambulatory, but believe one centralized point of contact would have improved our efficiency. We also noticed that daily deployment of staff is time consuming. Originally, we anticipated deploying staff on a day-to-day -day basis, but with the volume of people, that wasn't logistically possible. We decided instead to assign flexible individuals to departments in need of help and letting that department manager own the scheduling of the flexible member. This allowed them to balance the flex member schedule with the needs of the department. It also quickly became clear that consistency of assignment created efficiency. We deployed individuals to departments for all of their shifts during the pandemic because we noticed consistency of assignment offered substantial benefit. There were some roles that required quite a bit of training and having the same individual work day after day really decreased training needs and improved teamwork. Newly created teams also needed an assigned leader. So some of the support teams mentioned were brand new like our PPE experts and we didn't originally anticipate the staff questions uh, that staff would have, like, where do I show up and what do I wear on my first day? In most cases, those questions were being answered by the department managers where the flex pool colleague was assigned, but these new teams didn't have an assigned leader, and so these, those questions were sent to multiple locations. Things ran a lot smoother after identifying a leader to assign to each new support team. Lastly, we learned how hard it is to pull staff back to their home department. We are currently experiencing the issue of pulling the flex pool back to their normal job duties. As elective encounters ramp up and we slowly return to business as usual, meeting those needs while also supporting new COVID operations has been challenging. Some tasks like mass distribution at entrances has an unknown end date which complicates future planning. We should have identified upfront that a plan for long-term support without the flex pool was necessary. At Nebraska Medicine, we are currently just winding down from our peak of COVID patients. I'll now pass the presentation on to NYC, who is further along in their journey, so they can share how they address the COVID pandemic. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Omar Abdurrahman. I'm the chief nurse at Bellevue Hospital, uh, and I'm going to go over the workforce innovation, reassign, and deploy staff during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, at Bellevue NYC. So our objective is to maintain the standard of care and nurse excellence to the community we serve and adhere to the public hospital and healthcare mission. Uh, we had this plan to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis 
the manner that Bellevue has responded to the past event because we had the World Trade Center, so the Superstore Sandy, with total evacuation and other public mass casualty incidents in New York City. So the staffing coordination, the coordination among all staff leaders was uh, consists of deployment within the hospital. This is uh, consists with, uh, uh, as the, my colleague said before, is the extended from like other other units. But the main things really we focus on the ICU, which is was the, the the most area that get affected. We usually have about 40 patients in the ICU. We extend up up to 120 patients. So we needed a lot of ICU nurses. Unfortunately, we did not have the, uh, the enough nurses to deploy from med surge. But the, the, the good news is that we have many nurses that they were uh, assigned to different units, which is like even uh, care management, or uh, or could be also like in 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 many area like uh, even radiology. We were able to pull these nurses to give them an orientation within two days, and they were you know coming and they were part of the team. So we coordinate approximately 330 RN with the, with the designated COVID area. And uh, uh, we did really, we had also big help with agency. I mean, we are, we, have, we, are, we are part of a system that the system did help us bring all these nurses agency. The first couple, one or two weeks was a little, you know, difficult, but sooner after that, we get the help from the agency. and. In addition, the Department of Defense also deploy their staff to us. And this is like all of our, all of these people came at once to us, but the good news about our, we had a strong nursing education department that they work around the clock, like they were, they were orienting people days and night, not even, we never turn any, any nurse back or we say no to any, any redeployment. So in other words, all hands on deck. So everybody was here helping. We, we needed to increase the need of critical care. So we did, uh, we did open units. Uh, in the beginning, yes, uh, we didn't have enough IC unit, units, so we have to, to open from, you know, like uh, some of them, like I could give you an example of ambulatory surgery, and I'm gonna show you a picture later how it looked like. And we open it, we try to crack windows and, and put uh, HIPAA filters and, uh, you know, uh, it was not the, the best scenario, but I'll show you the difference between what before and after, what we, we already learned, lesson learned in the future. And so, as I say, we increase the capacity to, to, to house about 120 patients from 40 patients. We, we also, we did find out the reason for, you know, a need for renal replacement therapy, CRRT, hemodialysis, so that's uh, and peritoneal dialysis. So renal, we do we do use CRRT, but we needed more machine. We needed more, more patient. Even the regular hemodialysis, also we needed more machine and more also staff. And PD actually we did we did we turned the, the clock very fast and we were able to meet that demand. In addition, prone team and we had ECMO also patient coming to us through the CCU. So. In other words, we were the ability to replace staff for long-term interval where COVID positive that our goal was. So this will show you the picture of the redeployment of the Department of Defense. One picture when they, you know, that's the last picture when they came actually, and they asked us they were they, you know, they, we have to turn the clock and when they were supposed to call their their staff, and we we work it out very well with them. So as I say, the surge unit, uh, critical care nurse staff, this is the most important piece. So we used, as I said before, we used uh, you know, a lot of staff from uh, agency. Agency were able to help us to, you know, cope. We did use the, the uh, two units at least. We opened two new ICU units, one in 15 South. That's what I was telling you previously. I will show you the picture and then also, we use even uh, units like uh, uh, endoscopy, like we had to use it, even though it was not the most convenient area, but we were able to turn it around click quickly. Okay, now, what happened to our ICU that non-COVID? Because we, in actuality, we turned the whole ICU COVID. You know, uh, we thought we, we had to be ahead of, ahead of the, you know, any, any increase of number, but we were right about it. We needed every bed in the ICU, which is total 56. This is the main ICU we have. In addition, we had 
we had another about 20, 20 additional beds. So another, so what we did with the other patient that had non-COVID, actually we put them in the PACU. PACU actually was the one unit we did not have any COVID positive, they're all negative. So this way we, we are like taking care of this patient going there. And in addition, like in our eyes, in our emergency room at Bellevue, we have a unit called the emergency ward EW. This is, this is also as uh, an ICU unit and we utilize that also that as a respiratory unit to house all these COVID patients. And the one thing we did also in the ICU, we doubled the beds in the same room. We, we, I'm gonna, also, I'm gonna show you some picture. We label them A and Z. And uh, I mean, our room is, is big enough. That's one good thing. I know I saw it in other places, really you hardly could put equipment there. And uh, we were able to, you know, to maintain uh, we didn't have any issues with that, with, with any mix-up with patients, uh, you know, you know, in this, at this case. So th I'm showing you the picture to the right. You see the 15 South, this is the, the new one, and that's the list of the, the, you know, the previous when we started. So when we started, we have an open unit. This is an armchair unit. But if you look at the right, look at the glass door. We did it individual room. And now actually we, we moved this. You know, that gives us an opportunity to move a unit 15 south somewhere close, which is armchair close to the OR. So we move the whole unit and we turn it now also as an ICU and we use it as an ICU as of today. So this is the, the one of the endoscopy that we had in the beginning. We have to put them in like a waiting area, like which is, was not, you know, the most ideal, but we used it as soon as the number went down, that's the first unit we closed. So medicine, medicine, we had about uh, you know about 200 patients in the in the beginning, and uh, and we had a lot of sick patients coming, and some of them need need high flow oxygen, more observation. We of course, if you hear in the news, we, we everybody had these codes going on very frequently, but uh, med cells, we had enough staff really because we had that a lot of agency, and we. We got also the nurse extender from AmCare, like our AmCare was closed, so they, we were able to move uh, to move this patient. Now, in terms of engineering, our facility did a, a, a great work. They were able to go to these rooms, pop up a window, open and make an opening and put a hyperfilter machine to these rooms. So they were able really to make so many rooms as negative pressure to be used. So we did add a few units which is 7 East, like used to be a World Trade Center, but previously was a unit, so we, we moved it, we make it as a medicine unit, 15 North Surgical also converted uh, to COVID unit, 6 South also was a acute rehab, also was converted to COVID area. Uh, okay, so I told you we have the ECMO program uh, implemented and continue even through COVID, which was a success, and we were able actually just last week to discharge a patient going to rehab, you know, you know, a patient going like almost home, which is was a great success. Prone team, really, it's a it's a big one. You know, uh, Trish and and the doctors like put together a, a, a program. Especially, we use anesthesia orthopedic resident and even attending. They they join our our team to do and was consistent and and very helpful to work. You know, together and make this working until until you know it's wind down. Now, the renal replacement therapy, really, this is was big because we found out, at least when I asked, like, look at about 30% of the patient in the ICU really require a uh, kind of renal uh, therapy. So in the beginning, we were relying on CRRT. What we find out, that's, that's not going to work, like, for a long term because we need many machines. And the training takes time, actually, for more. But PD really is an easy uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more, you know, less time consuming with education. Our staff already knows. We haven't used it for a while, but took, you know, a few hours, they were able to go back and use it. And we, and, and also our surgeon were able to put all these catheters. So we were not really behind with, with giving the, the patient, you know, rerun replacement as needed. Uh, okay, so to use, the, now what we did is something like different to, to to meet the need. So there's two things we did really. We, we kind of we thought what can be done because first of all, when you have to enter the room, 
So very often, and time consuming for the PPE. So we use IV tube in extended extension so to bring the IV pump outside the room because our ICU is glass door. So that's, that's something we can use, which is give you visibility. And also we did that with the CRRT and we try to even sometimes to pull the patient close to the glass so we could visualize the patient as close as possible. So this is an example. You see to your right is a CRRT room outside the door, and that's also the other one is the IV hole with all, you know, outside the, the, the patient room. That's, a, that's a, the double room that we, I spoke to you, the H and Z, and uh, you see that there is space enough between the two beds. So, uh, you know, PPE was a concern. I know it was in the news everywhere, and you see it, all, it was all over the country. But we, you know, I can tell you today, we did not have major issues, very little issue with which we took care of it. Why? Because from the beginning, we know this is gonna be an issue. We did track what we have, what we need. We have central office that, that also we talk into us every day. We have this meeting every day at 8.30. At 8.30 in the morning, all, all, it's all of us senior leadership, the chief, chiefs, they have this call. You know, it's a webinar call, but everybody participate, include the SPU also, and they're talking about the need for any, 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 any need for PPEs. And we were tracking everything about PPEs. So yes, we did have, at one point, we had to change in 95 because what availability, but what our response was to add fit testing machine. So we had a lot of, we added, we added about four fit test machine in our, in our facility to, to meet the demand. So I can tell you, you know, I, people even ask if people, uh, most of our staff actually use N95, but I'm glad to say that we were able to meet the demand and we didn't have uh, issues of shortage. And the other, the other additional thing that, that, that covers, we did have, we did have enough covers when, when we needed more, we were able to get it and we ordered it. So we were able to, to meet the demand for both a mask and, and covers. So what, you know, if, you know, we spoke about the, the need for staffing. We, the last, you know, one piece, we, we would need to speak about the psychiatric need for staff, what staff suffer, how they feel. Because people out, people are scared, people, you know, lost some, some loved one. So we did have this really respite room. We, we have these places that people were, where we put these rooms for them to rest. We have all these, uh, you know, uh, team to, to uh, called H3, Help Heal Healer. This like, team also went to staff and spoke to staff and, and, uh, and assist and try to, to be there when, when they need it. So this is an example of, in the unit when they lost a the patient, uh, family. This is a, a, a priest that come also to the unit make round. If you see in the middle, there is a social worker also try to FaceTime the patient. So we had also more than FaceTime from outside. We have also this iPad, we used it. So we have all kind of like, uh, you know, uh, devices that we did may try to make sure that some connect connection between family and patient uh, continue to, to happen. So this is one example what I was telling you through, through the system, what we did. We got a chart, if you look at this, this is our, you know, our system, it starts from Bellevue, ended up with Metropolitan, and this is like how many, and could give you how many COVID patients we have in a day, and like if you look at Bellevue, for example, you have 12, which is one day, one day we have 120. Uh, that's in the ICU, next to it is 58. This is uh, the inpatient unit, and we, we had 200. So the, every day we got this chart, we know what's going on with, with the system at all, because during COVID, really, uh, if you're here in the news, Elmer's Hospital was the best, the one hit most. And I can tell you, in a daily basis, we used to get 40 transfers between Elmer's and some other hospital, include ICU and floor patients. So that's uh, like a, a dashboard that we, you know, central office shared us with us uh, uh, twice a day. So what opportunity, like we, we, uh, uh, you know, we had. So. You know, during COVID, yes, we make a decision like we, in the beginning, in the first one, two weeks, we need to focus what to take care of patients. For, we, we need to take, 
aside the need for a lot of quality, like for care plan, for example, we did not worry about the nurse, don't worry about care plan, make sure you do vital sign, what, take care of the patient, that's the most important uh, thing. Yes, we did have some increase in hospital acquired infection, uh, something to learn because this patient, and, and unfortunately some of them, some of these patients is hard also to turn uh, because of their condition. And, uh, and also like to monitor all these central lines and fully placement and maintenance. So in other words, like, uh, as, you know, as I, I tell you, with, with our, you know, COVID, you know, New York was hit the most here. And we, uh, you know, regret to say that we, we did lo lose a total of seven people. And just this is two of our, actually, uh, Ernesto de Leon, he was our ADN. That's a person that I met every day here a young with uh, you know, non-existing condition and he tried to work tirelessly here and uh, he was not able to make it. And this is our, also another nurse from the neonatal ICU. So we have reason to celebrate because yes, we did discharge like in your left side, one of our employee was also intubated, was able to go home. And we had a lot of patients that went home and our staff here. And I think like with mortality rate that we are, we are in the lower side, like, uh, you know, nation, nationally, that we are proud to say that we did the best we can during this pandemic. And thank you, everybody. Um, I think that, that's my last slide. I'm going to move it to Dina. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Bonnie Pru, and I am the System Director of Advanced Practice Providers for Emory Healthcare. And with me today is Dina Gillen our Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer of Ambulatory Patient Care at Emory. COVID came in like a hurricane and caused Emory Healthcare to react similarly as other healthcare organizations did across the country. Today, Dina and I are gonna discuss Emory Healthcare's ambulatory response and staffing efforts to how we manage the symptoms, screening, triage, medical management, and discharge processes for COVID-19 patients through creative RN and APP staff redeployment. In early March, we saw cases of COVID-19 rapidly increasing. We quickly closed our ORs to non-emergent procedures and clinics to ambulatory care. The transition to care for patients via telemedicine and caring for those with COVID-19 became our sole focus. The fluid, ever-changing journey of getting us the most current medical recommendations changed almost hourly. We had to transition from having patients have easy access to healthcare to now symptom identification, testing results, and managing of potentially COVID positive patients, keeping our focus on managing these patients outside of our emergency room. One of the first needs uh, that we identified was to have a single point of contact uh, for all of our patients, employees, staff, and faculty um, that had questions, concerns, and needed treatment uh, for COVID or COVID related symptoms. And so we developed a uh, RN COVID hotline. And as Bonnie mentioned, we also uh, we're shutting down all of our ambulatory surgery centers almost overnight. And so we were able to redeploy 65 ambulatory surgery RNs to be on our RN COVID hotline team. Having those RNs available seven days a week to answer questions, screen patients, triage, and make appropriate disposition was pivotal, pivotal to our system and for all the other activities that Bonnie's going to talk about going forward. We developed an electronic medical records use in the training. We also developed screening and triage algorithms and appropriate disposition tools for these ASC nurses who are not traditionally telehealth uh, RNs. And we were able to educate all 65 RNs within about three to five days so we could rapidly go live with this first contact source that was so pivotal to our system. These nurses were busy um, and continue to be so. Um, and it, this depicts our RN COVID line daily call volumes from a peak of around 1,300 calls per day to now a steady state of roughly 250 per day. And of course, we flex our staff um, accordingly. And like David mentioned, now that we're going back to what our new normal is, are having to balance the dichotomy of continuing COVID-related activities and um, the, the nurses going back to where their daily lives were, as in these nurses in the ASCs. So to attain the goals of managing these patients, we quickly identified advanced practice providers from our pre-op areas, as well as our ambulatory clinics that had closed and redeployed them to our results notification team. Having this high skill level of the APP allowed us to partner with our occupational health team to provide 
our patients and employees with high touch test results and quick symptom management. It also allowed us to be very fluid with the most up-to-date and constantly changing COVID-related information. We needed eight to 10 advanced practice providers per day to contact both our negative and positive patients seven days a week, totaling over 300 patients per day. Yet while talking to patients, we realized that the APPs needed a place, needed their patients to be seen outside the emergency room for symptom management. The next step was to utilize telemedicine to create a virtual clinic that would be the handoff from the COVID line and the APP results team. Through our electronic medical record, we connected our COVID positive patients and staff to medical care until symptoms were abated. To staff this clinic, our uh, general internal medicine and infectious disease partnered with our advanced practice providers to develop protocols for treatments and an intake that was a tiered risk-based scoring system which dictated the frequency and type of patient follow-up plans that could be implemented. This became known as our virtual outpatient management clinic. To date, we have had 486 unique patients with over 3,800 visits. And you can see by the pie chart over on the right side, the percentage of patients by tier stratification. The VOMC model allowed for adaptability with the ability to change risk tiers according to the patient's clinical course. We identified and redeployed eight advanced practice providers from, again, our pre-ops, as well as our medical and surgical specialty groups to partner with our physicians to do these thorough intake evaluations. We targeted NPs and PAs with primary care and chronic disease backgrounds, as these skill sets best fit the patient population. Our process map shows messages coming from our RN APP teams to the initial telemed intake and risk stratification based on comorbidities and symptom severity. Our tier one patients received every other day nurse calls and were deemed low risk. Tier two patients or moderate risk received daily RN calls. And tier three patients were called twice a day, once in the morning by the advanced practice provider and in the evening by the RN. Fluidity was key to moving patients up or down until they were discharged approximately 14 days later. Yet there was recognition that we still needed in-person visits for our sicker patients, again with the focus being um, emergency room visit prevention. An acute respiratory clinic was established for our COVID positive patients, and we were also able to funnel our influenza-like illness patients that were not tested but presumed positive here as well. Given in initially we did not have enough PPE or testing capabilities, this multidisciplinary clinic comprised of nurses, general internal medicine providers, infectious disease doctors, and our advanced practice providers was able to accommodate these patients. In this clinic, we could also accommodate uh, patients from our primary care practices, as well as our VOMC that required vitals, physical exam, chest x-ray, labs, or even echo and EKGs. Ret retrospective data has showed that 50.7% of the patients seen in both our ARC and VOMC clinic were our primary care patients, but also showed that we were able to capture, capture new patients as resources to our staff and our community. Our process map looks like an electrical box, which shows the many entry points into our R clinic. Referrals came from primary care providers, our VOMC clinic, our emergency department, and even our subspecialists. We were able to streamline patients through the RN COVID hotline handoff, as well as our APP results team, who could quickly identify patients who needed more urgent assessments and care. The provider team encompassed approximately 2.5 FTEs of physicians be it ID or general internal medicine, as well as 1.5 FTEs of APPs, accommodating patients seven days a week, seeing up to 30 patients a day. To date, we've had 525 visits and touched 490 individual patients. Our summary slide shows all of our outpatient COVID work to date. From our RN line to our screening to our ART clinic, we've touched over 15,000 lives and continue to work on this on a daily basis. Other areas we identified on the ambulatory setting were the transition of our inpatient COVID positive patients to home after discharge. We identified four of our highly skilled primary care advanced practice providers and utilizing telemedicine provided a post hospital discharge evaluation within 24 to 48 hours, assessing for immediate issues and connecting the patients into our ARC, VOMC or back to their primary care provider. 
our trend line shows that discharges are trending down, also with the corresponding decrease in our admissions to our hospitals. As I spoke of earlier, given the limitations to testing, all patients seen are in our emergency room, those that were discharged with a diagnosis of an influenza-like illness without testing and presumed positive needed management. One of our primary care practices partnered with our emergency rooms and created a handoff for these patients to have a telemedicine visit with a primary care advanced practice provider 24 hours after discharge. This enabled us to guide the patients through the next steps of care and connect them back into the systems we had prior built. This team of six APPs worked to provide this care, building the visits into a schedule that afforded them the second half of the day for their primary care patients and telemedicine visits or in-person care. As the volumes have decreased, we were able to hand this back to the APP teams in our emergency room settings. 12 weeks later, we're learning how to manage life in healthcare, returning to normal and living, living with COVID-19. During peak COVID, we had roughly 18 FTEs of advanced practice providers dedicated solely to results, our VOMC, ARC, and post-hospital discharge patients. With the downtrend, we have shifted our RNs and our APPs back to their home clinics. We've seen an increase in our need for testing to return to normal volumes of procedures and surgeries. This work requi requires an increase in our RNs and APPs, so FTEs will have to be justified and again, looking for bodies to be redeployed. We also moved to contact tracing and partnering with corporations to help them safely return their employees back to work. The challenge will be to balance COVID-related ambulatory work and maximizing staffing to cover original patient care as well. Our trends in our COVID clinics are decreasing, but the ability to ramp back up in case of surge needs to be prepared for. In creating a COVID-related bu related budget for FY21, we believe that we will need to allocate or redeploy multiple APPs and up to 40 RNs to cover the needed care that, we, that will ensue. Our key takeaways. Here at Emory, we have a robust advanced practice provider leadership structure that has enabled us to quickly identify each advanced practice provider in our service lines by certification type and history of work in key specialty areas such as hospital medicine, ED, and ICU. We were then able to redeploy staff about the system to support the quickly changing needs. This has been sustained as our anesthetists and house staff have returned to their areas, areas and ORs. Our chief advanced practice provider in our Emory Critical Care Center has worked with unit leads to develop criteria for other advanced practice provider staff to apply and be redeployed to continue help in our intensive care units. We've successfully integrated three FTEs of emergency room providers into the ICU to support our COVID and non-COVID related patients. We quickly moved and will continue to maximize telemedicine as a venue to care for our patients. We were able to build clinics and redeploy our RN and APPs to care for our COVID-19 patients to decrease ED usage. We are ramping down, but also preparing for staff, staff, preparing our staff in case of surge. Finally, multiple connections were made across the system, not only in our care management team transitioning patients to home, but in moving advanced practice providers from departments across the system. These relationships will persist and enable us to provide better care for our high-risk patients. Thank you so much to all of our subject matter experts for sharing um, their experiences uh, over COVID-19 the past couple months, or responding to COVID-19 the past couple months. Um, before we get into Q&A, there are a couple questions we'll pose here. Just a reminder that NETEC is here to help. We continue to build resources and develop online education and deliver technical training to meet uh, your needs. Please send questions to info at NETEC.org. Um, also make sure you check out our website. There, was a, there is a question in the Q&A about the availability of slides. So this will be posted on our YouTube channel, the recording will, alongside also PDF copies of the slide deck. So those will be available and you can find all those at NETech.org. It usually takes about 24 to 48 hours, but of course, um, TGIF, it is Friday in the weekend. So we will give our crew until Monday to get that done. All right, so Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so David Seeley, you did a great job of answering some of these questions in the chat box. So um, I'll go ahead and close them and perhaps um, someone from the Emory or New York crew would be uh, available to answer the question. So the first one was, did you develop any role for nurse practitioners? 
Hi, good wants morning. To. This is Mia Scaramazzino from Bellevue. So um, the first group of nurses that we received through the agencies were NPs. Um, but most of them hadn't been in the clinical area and their expertise for a while. And because the patients were so complicated, they, you know, didn't feel prepared. So we developed other roles for them. So we had a lot of renal replacement therapy needs. So we taught them how to do CRRT. And we, um, and, and we also had them doing nasal pharyngeal swabs because we had such a great um, number of patients that required swabbing, and at that time you had to get, uh, you know, donned and put all the PPP, PPE on to go in the rooms. So we had them doing swabbing and renal replacement therapy. So this is Bonnie. We actually were able to, um, using the tool, our APP redeployment tool that we use, um, our leadership used, we're able to identify advanced practice providers that had skill sets and were able to, able to partner them in not only the emergency room, but also hospital medicine so that we could create care teams um, managing the COVID positive patients. We also were able to re successfully redeploy both our anesthetist assistants as well as our CRNAs into our intensive care units. Um, to uh, occasionally carry their own patient load, but also um, support our APPs that were working in those areas. Thank you. And, uh, and David, you did uh, note your answer in the chat in the Q&A box, but do you have anything you want to expand upon that? Um, no, I think we had a very similar experience where there was kind of some highly skilled ones that we almost um, added to our provider pool. And then there was ones that had been away from the bedside for quite a while that we put more in kind of like a RN extender role. Thank you. And then um, another question is, how often did you ask employees to submit their schedules of availability? Um, Dina or Bonnie, do you want to start? And then we'll ask New York and David, you also answered this in the Q&A box as well. So this is Bonnie. We, we actually um, developed a Google tool that we used to be able to have people sign up so that we weren't competing and um, uh, having extra duty pay from trying to still accommodate areas where people were working, but could also be redeployed to some of the other areas. And that worked out quite well. And this is Dina to add on to that. Um, we also, for the entire system, similar to David's tool, um, had a redeployment tool that we asked leaders to go in uh, weekly and update the availability of their staff um, so we could see where pay, uh, staff could be available to be redeployed to and from um, every week. For us, we, we have it already, like when we deploy people, we, I have somebody over in all the deployment. So we know where is everybody and where he work and how many people we need or we need to get from the agency. So we were, we were, we had no issues with that whatsoever. Thank you. And yeah, then this is David. I'll add the question. The question was kind of like, how often did we ask for availability? And I think that was something we kind of kept doing in two week increments. Um, you know, since there was so much uncertainty. You know, we didn't really know it was going to be mid-March to end of June. We kind of just every week we're making an assessment on do we think that the flex pool is still necessary and kind of around Memorial Day is when we decided to discontinue that. Some of the workers are still in that role, but we kind of disbanded the whole flex pool operations around Memorial Day. And at Bellevue, we just like dismantled this a week or two weeks ago. We had everything in place until, you know, we didn't know which way we're going, but luckily we, you know, the number are going down. Thank you. And then uh, David, we'll go ahead and start with you and then go to uh, New York and Emory for the last question. Did you train up IMC levels to ICU level? What is the decision for these trained up IMC nurses for the future? Continue ICU level care and officially become ICU nurses in the MICU, CCU, et cetera. Um, I'll say we've had kind of, we're still kind of working on some of that. Um, some people we have from our med surge units that volunteered and they wanted to be ICU extenders. And so I think some of our hope is that those people will take that opportunity and continue into that role. Um, you know, and some of it is just the unknown on, uh, for us, we did a primary nursing care model and this kind of forced us into that team model, but we're hoping that we'll 
we'll find some things that we want to keep around past the pandemic. But, um, you know, a lot of those decisions still haven't been made. Uh, but we did actually start training up some people that um, I think have been successful. So Bellevue actually, since, you know, I met Serge, as I told you, we didn't have even enough to start with. I didn't feel at one point, even when we try to approach nurses, they have a high level of anxiety to go to an ICU. And I don't want, I didn't believe that if I, I cannot put, I could put five nurses to cover like two patients, which is take away from one area to the other. But as I say, the buffer for me was, is to use the, old, the previous ICU nurses to send them more to this, to this unit. Uh, to continue, like if I look backward, really what can, can be helping is if we have the mid, mid, mid way, you know, like a, a step down nurses that they could go to ICU. So what I've been doing the last, you know, from last month, because right now I have good staffing, I've been pulling a lot of nurses to do the intensive care course for, for step down, which is two weeks. Usually the ICU course is three weeks. So they are little steps from the ICU. So if I need them in the future, it's take me a day or a two, and they are more comfortable. So we also move in a transition after this COVID. We increase in our, our ICU capacity. We put in a lot of step down kind of high acuity in the floor. So this this way, when you pull a nurse later on from the floor, it's way you know better than just to bring her from a regular floor, you know, all the way to the ICU. And then, uh, Dina, did uh, did Emery have any anything to add there as well? Um, nothing more, much more to add. Um, I'm an ambulatory CNO, but as you know a little bit of, of what we, what was going on um, with that. And I, I don't, we are in discussions of how that might look. And like, like David, we're talking, and this has given us an opportunity to look at team models differently uh, than what we had done. Um, as of now, we are almost fully 100% back to, to pre-COVID uh, volumes across all 11 hospitals and all of our ambulatory sites. And so all, everyone has kind of gone back to their home units. Um, but we certainly are, are looking at this of, of how we, another surge comes or um, how we need to look at, at modeling differently. This has given us a lot of real opportunity um, into the way to practice in a different way that we had not thought of before. So we are kind of putting all this together and, and working through that um, for, you know, for future planning. Well, great. Well, thank you all very much for your time and your expertise and your perspectives on this. Um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And then lastly, um, please can please uh, follow us on all of our social media channels, um, our e-learning center at courses.needtech.org. We have a YouTube channel where we have just-in-time videos and shorter resource videos. Um, we are posting on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and of course, we have our email and we have our website. So please visit us, join the conversation. We love to hear from everybody. And happy Friday. I hope you all have an excellent weekend. Thank you for attending this webinar and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.